Welcome to The Interesting Podcast, episode number 152. This episode is with my new friend, Greg Baldwin. What a great dude. Man, the magic of meeting a kindred spirit will never be lost on me. And this was one of those conversations. Greg is awesome. And we talked about a ton of stuff. We talked about surviving these crazy times amidst a pandemic, uh, his love of Disney, working on the movie credits for Marvel's Phase 2. I know, isn't that crazy? An insane story about how getting the cast album for Pacific Overtures came back full circle later on in his life, getting the call to play Uncle Iroh in Avatar The Last Airbender, his theory about Tara Sanube from Star Wars The Clone Wars. He gives great advice for actors, and so much more. He's a joy of a man, and you are in for a treat. So without further ado, let's just jump right into it. Please enjoy this episode of The Interesting Podcast, number 152, with Greg Baldwin. Theme song time. very patient man very good. patient <laughs> good that's a good that's a yeah it's definitely a, a a good aspect yeah yeah person. it comes it comes in handy i find i find Sometimes, pretty often uh, yeah. definitely this last year patience is oh definitely my a god for real it's just uh, this whole thing this whole thing we're in a we're in such a weird reality where i like to say it'll be great to say we lived through it you know, once we're done yes. and we all will have our war stories and we'll get together and we'll get drunk yeah. and we'll talk about what it was like back in 2020, exactly. you know, the year of the, the, the plague year. Yeah, exactly. Uh, it's like, you know, what it's a what was your mask? What did it look like? Did it have a cool did it have a cool thing? And you're like, yeah, mine did. Mine did. <laughs> I've taken to wearing I mean, I, yeah, I'm fully vaccinated now, but I, I've taken oh, to wearing yeah. two. Smart. Just because I find the two. It clears down the fogging on my glasses. I guess, I guess oh, because it's a tighter seal. And smart. so I find that if I wear two, I, I don't have to worry so much about, you know, not being able to really? see. Really? You know what? Yeah. I'm going to tell my wife that. She wears glasses. And every time we leave, it's like. Phew. It really <laughs> helped, you know, with the, the, the medical one under that ended up being a cloth one over the medical one. And yeah. It, it seemed to cut down on it, you know. Huh. Okay. I'm into that. I'm into that. I always wanted to do the cool, like, what are they called? Gators? The, like, masks, you know? Yeah, yeah. The things that came up. Yeah. Yeah, I, I can't do it. I've got that weird thing where like if I have a shirt that's too tight, I'm like, and I don't like it. It's it, I'm limiting myself here. I uh, I don't when well, no, you know, on the other hand, I mean, you know, I, I, if anything good comes out of all this and I think good comes out of everything. Agreed. Uh, I, I, people are when people get sick and have colds, you know, you're used to like, oh, I'll just go to work and I'll suffer through it. Yeah. You know, I'll go to the <laughs> sure. store. And I think. People, uh, when they start to feel just a little bit coldish, feverish, mm -hmm. you know, and used to it would have been weird to have seen somebody in a mask at the grocery store. Yeah. But now I think people will accept and go, oh, that person probably has a cold and, you know. Yeah. Yeah. Respectful of, uh, of the people around. So. I agree. I agree. That's I don't fine. mind it. I don't mind the mask. I really don't. I'm like, you know what? Oh, no, no. You, know, you know, I mean, I would like, I would very much like. I will know that it's well and truly over when I can sit in a crowd. Because my wife and I have discovered when I go out to go out to a restaurant, especially if you're someplace else. Sure. Don't sit. Don't sit at the table. Sit at the bar. Yeah. Sit at a bar because that's where you're going to meet people from or that are from the area. You're going to make new mm -hmm. friends. And the day that I can just sit in a crowded bar next to a stranger without a mask. Yeah. You know that I will know that this is truly over. Yep. Right there, right there with you. I I like people. Do you like people? Do you find like you know what I I do I do, but I also I enjoy my, in an odd way, being all by myself. You know, just with my wife. I I don't mind it too much. I always sure. enjoy just, you know, and and I've made no secret of the fact that I I do enjoy my cannabis. Yeah. So actually, why not? You know, I, don't, I don't mind. Uh, <laughs> you know, I'm just. For the most part, I mean, I like my wife very much. We're good friends. That helps. It hasn't been too hard. And also, honestly, things like this. And I, I, honestly, I swear to God, the, the cameos 
oh have, yeah have saved my life good they've given me a connection to people yeah and it has really been helpful you know i always say uh after the pandemic before it was like oh new birthday happy graduation and more and more of them started creeping in it's like oh this is just for me i just want uncle iro to oh, tell me cool. it's all gonna be okay oh. and by me doing that it helped convince me that it maybe it's all gonna be okay yeah so it's actually been uh yeah you know it's been okay it, it has really fed my I mean, you know, I, we've seen my kids, you know, in person a couple of times, which is good. Sure. Uh, my son lives in New York and he came and he quarantined for 14 days before coming to see us. Nice, we nice. Arrived both times. And my daughter and her boyfriend came out in uh, at Christmas. They drove through, but they got tested the minute they got here. There you go. You did good. Negative. We should, we still shouldn't have, but it was Christmas and they yeah. both had a negative test. So it's like, you know. I hear you. I hear you. <laughs> my wife's a nurse so she gets tested twice a week and i'm like oh, what so if you, you get know you're, pretty, you're, you're gonna be pretty yeah, sad exactly every every few days when she's like i'm negative i was like cool that means i'm negative <laughs> negative where where are you i'm in florida florida like, whereabouts yeah uh do you know where naples is it's I, like I, southwest I the gulf side right yep 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 outside say the far south that's I, the one from there yeah mm -hmm. i yep. didn't know where it home of the newlywed and the nearly dead <laughs> you were my wife and I really my sadly my my relationship with Florida is I've only been at Disney World. And right, of, I mean, listen, you're doing all right. <laughs> I, my brother has been to Miami and he okay. said you gotta go to Miami. He actually fell in love with it. Miami's pretty cool. Food and uh but we were literally just talking about when all this is over. My wife and I had our honeymoon at Walt oh. Disney World in nineteen eighty four when Epcot was new. Oh, That's there you go. Big. I've always been a big Disney parks, you know. Oh, main. cool. I didn't know that. Uh, and then we went back with the kids and I think it was 2003. Mm -hmm. And we were kind of thinking it might be fun now that the kids are grown to go back. Yeah, oh, there you they, go. Uh, It'd be a little harder to have them on your yeah. shoulders, but I think we could figure yeah, it out. <laughs> yeah. We want to do that pub crawl. Yeah, there you go. Pub crawl together with my kids. I think that could be fun. Yeah. I love Disney. That's uh, so cool. I, I did not know this. Oh, my, my, and it was interesting. My son and I are very much alike because we watch the same shows. Yeah. Like, oh, you ride that 360 degree wide ride through, you know, the other day. Yeah. You know, so. Yeah. You know, kind of, uh, and I, he just learned that. I mean, the kids were lucky. I worked for Disney for many, many years in, in the legal department. So all the time they really? were growing up, we had, uh, it was called a silver pass, you know, for employees. Oh, nice. It got myself and my dependents into the park for free. There you go. So my kids basically grew up at Disneyland because wow. we would go because it was cheap. Oh, we yeah, got, yeah. Why not? Apparently, Disney is not cheap. Yeah. But <laughs> us, I was like, oh, you know what? The kids are getting fussy this afternoon. Let's just take them down to Disneyland and we'll, you know, walk Perfect. around, ride a couple of rides and come home until the dreaded everything was great they loved the dark rides and i don't know what happened they were about four three and four respectively mm -hmm. and we were on alice in wonderland which is i think only is only in anaheim i don't think there's one in in, in florida but right alice. and it's a little creepy a little bit a little uh, bit the flick the switch flipped and they wouldn't go on another you know literally them years to get them on a ride again a dark ride that's funny you're like we've done this already why is it different <laughs> now <laughs> no you know what it's like there was just something you know that, that all those cards rushing at them i don't know but it, it sure it, <laughs> we're now, done with this that phase is over <laughs> now we were finally able to get him back in many years later finally we're able to get him into the haunted mansion oh but there you go the haunted mansion christmas and uh, they were course. intrigued with the jack skellington you know they would never have gone Sure. <laughs> for them, that would be the scariest one of all. Right. <laughs> you know, they thought, okay, let's go in and look at it. And after that, it was all good. There you go. You had to do Haunted Mansion light. <laughs> Absolutely. And then it got them right now. They love it, you know. There you uh, go. I, when I, the day that I can walk back into a Disney park, I guess just because I spent so much time at the one in Anaheim, I right. told my, I'm going to cry like a baby when I walk through that. Again. Oh, yeah. Well, walk through those portals again. Oh, just, yeah. That it's open again. Yeah. 
Yeah. This for many, you know, the saddest when I really wanted to make myself sad this year, I would uh, think about Disneyland and Broadway. Dark. Oh yeah, yeah. That just doesn't compute a world where you don't have that, you know, magic. that fantasy, that, that magic. Exactly, that yeah, magic. I totally That's agree. Exactly the word. Mm -hmm. And it's like it, it, the world. It's nice to know that we're gonna be getting a little magic back, you know, slowly. Yeah. It's going to be that second wave where, I mean, it's one of those things they talk about, like where bad experiences, the good thing that comes out of them is the like enjoyment of the good things, the perspective, Absolutely. you know, and you know I think, I think also I've learned, I lived in LA for many years and I I'm sitting right now in, there was in our house in Albuquerque when we bought it, there was a moldy old one car garage. This thing was in terrible shape. <laughs> and we said, well, you know what? Let's just turn that into a little studio apartment for when the kids come home, you know? There you go. And then my wife had the idea. So, well, why don't we just put a little closet? It'll be a closet slash recording booth. Perfect. And I had intended, okay, well, this will just be good enough for me to go and audition from this booth. And then for gigs, I'd have to fly into LA. Of course. It's only an hour and a half away. And then the pandemic hit. And then I had to buy a lot more. Yeah. <laughs> yep. But now I don't have to leave. I, and I think one of the good things that may come out of it is this whole working from home. Yeah. You know, Agreed. It's better for the environment. It's better for families, you know. Mm -hmm. And I, now that the cat's out of the bag, the, the industries can't say, well, you know, you need to come in and do this. Well, it was working just fine when I was doing it from home, you know. Yeah. Oh, it's been great. It's especially like from Florida. I built a booth in my room a few months ago because I was like, oh, the, the playing field is leveled now, regardless of where you are. Yeah, because absolutely. if you have the right things, what are you going to do? You know, I, I have literally, you know, I, I've recorded uh, some of the Ghost of Tsushima games. Yeah, yeah. Disney. Really? And I'm on a Disney show and Disney I record from this little closet. That's amazing. I kind of was looking forward to going back to L.A. periodically, but on the other sure. hand, the commute i can't beat the commute yeah i hear you i hear you it's so cool how how adaptable people are huh Isn't that cool and i think i think there will be good coming uh, there good will good comes out of everything good i think so too come out of this. i think so too i'm not sure the, I'm for this shit to be over yeah at the very least i'm hoping empathy you know more than anything else just like the the focus on empathy and like oh right this is actually really important <laughs> is you know i mean it really is and and the fact that there is still such a lack of empathy amongst yeah. citizens of this country yeah uh, it's just mind-boggling to me after it we've is. all been through this together and what's wonderful and also horrible but also how many shared experiences do we go through together true george Clooney went through this yeah you know, everybody that's true this. everybody had to adapt their lives yeah and try stay alive and not get the disease yeah and you, you would think that that would make us you know closer and maybe yeah. it will. maybe it will if for some people it will at the very least you know it's the that's the good thing is like this massive light that's shined on everything it showed the focus of empathy but it also showed the things that aren't empathetic and you're like all right this is equally important to recognize to be like oh none of this anymore please <laughs> you know so i i am Nah, my wife is more optimistic. I, I tend to, be, I always <laughs> like to think about the worst case scenario and then proceed from there. Which sure. is also our way of doing things. What's the worst that could happen? I do Let the exact same thing. That. I do yeah. the exact same thing because it hurts. It's it can happen. Yeah. And then when it happens, it you're like, happen. okay. Yeah, yeah. dude, it's same. <laughs> I do the exact same thing. I'm like, whenever my wife's stressed, I'm like, all right, what's the worst thing? Let's assume that's going to happen. That way, when it does happen, it stings less because we prepared for it. We prepared for it. Yeah, it's just smart. Although, although I must say, I could, we literally, we lived in LA for 30 years, sold yeah. our house, and moved to New Mexico on March 1st, 2020. Oh, perfect. So <laughs> our year here has been not what we imagined. Yeah, I imagine. <laughs> but as I said, on the other hand, you know, if if I really had to pick a time to move to a sparsely, you know, populated state where I didn't know anybody. Oh, yeah. It was a great time. <laughs> <Yeah. to move. laughs> you got out right in time. Exactly. Oh, man. So you lived in L.A. for 30 years. Where were you born then? 
I was born, one of the reasons I came, I was born in Grants, which in New Mexico, it's a little town about 60 okay, miles. Okay, okay. And we have been coming to New Mexico for vacations many, mm. many, many years. And I, I love this place. I love the food and the climate. And several years ago, five years ago, there was a good chance that my wife and I were both going to be laid off from our day gigs. And mm. our kids' college loans were just coming due. So oh, we had to do like think about, okay, uh, what, what are cities where we can work? What are production hubs? Where are the best cities that we can work? Mm-hmm. And we're going through the list and it's like, oh, you know, Atlanta, no, too hot, you know, too yep. Southern. Uh, and then Albuquerque. Wow, we love New Mexico. So we came out here and I just found this neighborhood in, in Albuquerque called Knob Hill, which is right along the old Route 66 downtown. A lot of the old, I love mid-century architecture and a lot sure. of that architecture and the motels and everything is still intact. Nice. I fell in love with it. And we started coming here every year. And I was looking at Zillow and this house came up and said, this house is perfect. It's exactly what we want. And uh, we said, you know, the kids were grown. Let's, let's do it. You know, always assuming that I would just, it was close enough. It's 10, it's, I think 10 hours by car to LA hour and a half by airplane that we could come and go. Sure. Not imagining that we would be, you know, this is yeah. it. Yeah. You know? Sure. Yeah. Food. I love the climate. It snowed this morning. And what? it always snows just enough. You know, yeah. it doesn't snow <laughs> a lot, but just enough to be interesting. Sure. Just enough to be gone in a few days. <laughs> yeah. I, I, I really love it here. And I love the fact that when somebody says it's 10 minutes to get someplace, yeah. it's actually 10 minutes to get someplace as opposed sure. to in LA 10 minutes. <laughs> yeah. I, if I was in Burbank and I had to be in Santa Monica. Oh, uh, forget about it. I think it's only like 10, 10 miles, maybe from Burbank, maybe 15 at the most. It, 10 miles flying. <laughs> yeah. And I literally would say, okay, I have to get to Santa Monica. I'm going to need to give myself two hours to get there and two hours to get back. Yeah. Isn't that crazy? And, just and sheer I, density uh, is just insane. That's something too that's going to happen as a result of this pandemic is people are going to go, why am I paying all this money to live in Los Angeles and San Francisco and New York when I could mm-hmm. go live someplace that's the quality of life is going to, and don't get me wrong. I love Los Angeles. LA is a it's city great. Unlike any other, it's a city where dreams, I, you know, if I may wax philosophic, where dreams can come true. Absolutely. No who you are, you can come to LA and if you persevere and you stick with it and you have a little, again, oddly enough, talent isn't, I think perseverance in the long run is more important yeah, than talent. I find the same. Uh, but if you just stick it out, you could, you can, you can ha- do pod. People will want to do podcasts with yeah. you. <laughs> <laughs> goals. You know? We have goals now. <laughs> so, you know, so it's wonderful for that. And the weather is great. Yeah. But, Again, 70 and sunny every day. I kind of like the four seasons here. A little yeah, bit. that's the give and take. Like uh, the thing I love about LA is the fact that it's, you feel the creativity in the air because everyone's there to try and create. You're like, you walk into Starbucks and there's eight people that are all like all dreams and you can taste it almost. It's, yes, you can absolutely. The dreaming is, is yeah. I, think, I think it's a dreamer city more than any other city in the whole world. I think so too. Literally can take your dreams and you can, you can through force of will and luck and a bunch of other circumstances, you can make Mm -hmm. dreams real. It's really cool. There will always be people moving to LA. Of course. But it's, it's, it's also nice to have the option, you know, not yeah, to pay, to college, you know, just to live there. It's true. That's the that's the real dream. What you're doing, where you can go into the dream sequence and then come back out to sleep. <laughs> it's fantastic, you know. <laughs> Honestly, I, you know, sometimes I think I'm going to get hit by a bus. Any, well, ultimately, I suppose I will. Yeah. <laughs> Are we all? You know. <laughs> but yeah. Ultimately, the bus does show up. But I mean, everything. My life is good. Yeah. I, I had, I mean, sometimes I think my I, I I had loving parents. I had an uneventful childhood. The worst thing that happened in my childhood was my father worked for, he was a bank examiner for the government. Oh, so we okay. moved around a lot. I sure. moved, that was the worst thing that happened to me. But happily married for 35 years. My kids are both wonderful and, and, and wonderful adults that I love to hang out with. And then I get to be Uncle Iroh. Yeah. Yeah. You, know? <laughs> yeah. you did all right, Greg. You did all right. It's not, it's not so bad, you know. <laughs> that, you know I, that's it. That's interesting. So if your dad did banking, you said you did finance and stuff. 
So then where did where the entertainment bug hit? When did you oh, want no. to be an actor? I was uh, I did uh I did screen credits for many, many years. Oh I, really? I like I uh I always like to say this is surprising, you know, world's yeah, yeah. colliding. When you watch any film from the Marvel phase two, mm-hmm. which is Iron Man three through Ant Man, and you look at the screen credits at the end, all of those millions of Marvel credits, millions of names. Mm-hmm. That was my work. No way. That what? The, that's I did credits, you know, which was uh what do you what apparently. what does that entail? Like how how does that work? It's part of the legal department and a lot of it is spell checking. Ah. But also a lot of it, especially at Marvel, was going through the contracts and checking the provisions because for the really big actors, Marvel size actors. Sure. Well, there are stipulations that their names must be in not only in this order in the one sheet, but must be a certain size in the one sheet. Oh, really? Uh, sometimes even a certain color. Huh. Uh, and likeness, it's likeness. So, for example, if, say, Chris Evans' likeness appears in the one sheet, then Chris Hemsworth's likeness also has to appear in a substantially the same size. Oh. So it's kind of legal. So it, definitely part of legal. Sure. Uh, and it was, you know, put, put food on the table, got my, you know, raised my Oh, yeah. Kid. That's uh, so cool. And it was kind of, it, for the most part, it was an interesting job. It did have moments of terror. Uh, yeah, yeah, Marvel I can imagine. Would, Marvel was very kind. They would uh, actually invite the employees to the actual premiere. The no actual way. The Hollywood premiere with all, the, with all the stars there, with everybody. And it was really great. Yeah. And seeing those credits 30 feet high. At yeah. The end, knowing that if there's a mistake, oh, no. the executive <laughs> producer's name this is not going to be a good night for me. Sure. And I literally would sit there with my eyes closed next to my wife, just, okay, tell me when the credit sequence is over. Tell me when the credit <laughs> is over. No, has it stopped yet? So yeah, there, there, it, was, it was not without terror. That's so funny. Because normally people are watching credits to like see the credit of who, oh, who worked on this, but you're like, oh man, here's, here, it's time. It's time, it's time. It's That's time, it's time. Stressful. <laughs> <laughs> and, and over the years, you, I learned a lot of things. I learned that if, if you really have to misspell credit, a second unit grip is a better choice than, say, uh, the one of the actor's personal assistants. Yeah. <laughs> <good point. laughs> There's more grace to some positions. Yeah, you, you, learn, you learn what's really going to bite you in the ass if you don't get it right. Yeah. Wow. Well, how do you even start a job like that? How do you get into credits? Well, it was an interesting my wife, uh, when we moved to LA, and I had always we moved to LA so I could be an actor back in '87. Oh, cool, cool. And my wife just literally uh, answered an ad in the newspaper. No for way. Credits, and so she went to work at Disney, and we became very good friends with everybody that worked there. Such good friends that indeed one of her bosses ended up marrying her brother. Oh. And uh, Melissa had moved on at this point, I think, to and. Uh, from her position but they were hiring an assistant for her old position at disney and i oh. think i was i was doing data entry for kaiser at the time and uh i got into it you know like it's the old hollywood story nepotism man That's yeah how it's all who you know it absolutely Every, everything i i've learned that the hard way in the last seven years pursuing this is everything is who you know all of you it know, people ask me <laughs> You know, how, how do you, how can you, how do you, how do you, uh, how can you make it in voice acting? And I always say, well, you know what worked for me? I was really good friends with a showrunner. So, yeah. you know. <laughs> <laughs> that's you can, how it works. <laughs> if you can be good friends with a showrunner, then that's going to help you a lot. Yeah. And indeed, it has. Nice. I mean, Bill has helped me immeasurably. He gave me my first uh, animated role. It was uh, a guest spot on Shaolin Showdown. Oh, what? I Many, love that show. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And I walked in, it was, oh, I was petrified. And Bill did this for me because Bill thought it was funny. It was a surprise. He knew that I had gone to a college with another voice actor named Jeff Bennett. Very, oh, very famous yep. actor. Perfect. You know, like mm-hmm. top, top of the top of the voice acting, you know. Yeah. And we had competed against each other in high school. He had gone to the same college. When Jeff moved to LA, he, had, he and his wife actually stayed with my wife and I while they looked for Oh, him. cool. And... Jeff was playing, I think, Clay in that, a Texas boy. Oh, yeah, yeah. And Bill that. thought, because we were both, we had, been, had lived in Texas, I think Jeff was from Texas, and I was raised in Texas, mm-hmm. thought it'd be funny to just cast me as his father. <laughs> his father. And just as a surprise to Jeff. And so I was, first of all, I was petrified. 
and then I walk into my very first feature, you know, animated gig TV animation, mm-hmm. and it's Jeff Bennett's there. Of course. Eric there. Oh, I, I, you know. Good luck. <laughs> uh, <laughs> you better show up, Greg. <laughs> oh, my God. I get, Tom Kenny was there. Oh. I mean, literally. No deal. <laughs> this was like, I'm in a room with, oh, my God, you people are oh real gods and i'm like yeah oh i hope i don't screw up yeah, right, yeah. Of- <laughs> you're looking at but mount rushmore of voice artists <laughs> you got me got me my first credit uh in television animation and got me an agent hell Bill, yeah uh, and then it actually helped because his agent had come to the record that day oh and dude he, you know, so you know he was able to introduce me and so i was able to get a, a good uh voiceover agent wow so if you moved to L.A. to be an actor, was it always like voiceover on camera, theater, or you're like any of it? Well, you know, I I, I had always been a rather creative child. I yeah. <laughs> uh, I mean, I'm making up toys, you know, those songs and, and poems, of, you know, when I was like in first grade. Sure. But I saw a film in 1970 uh, called Scrooge with Albert oh. Finney. It was a musical. And. It literally changed my life. Yeah. I was 10 years old, I walked in and I saw this movie. First of all, I, I think it was the first musical I ever remembered seeing. Oh, and perfect. I was just blown away by musicals in general. Oh, I can't yeah. believe you could be this happy and wonderful and magical. Mm-hmm. And then I think I had read somewhere that Albert Finney was the only actor that had ever played young Scrooge and old Scrooge. Because oh. he was only in his late 30s at the time. Sure. And I thought, oh, wow. So you can be yourself, but you can also be a 70-year-old version of yourself. That's yeah. cool. That's what I want to do. Sure. So I started uh, I, from that point on. That's what I wanted. That's what to did do. it. And I wanted nothing for Christmas or for my birthdays, but cast album recordings from Broadway, from musicals on Broadway. Oh, cool. And that led to 1977. When uh, for my 17th birthday, I got the cast album from a show called Pacific Overtures, Mm -hmm. written by Stephen Sondheim. It was about the opening of Japan in 1853, a very avant-garde for it's still avant-garde. And it starred an actor named Mako Iwamatsu. And I I fell in love with this musical. I could sing every note. I could sing every note for you right now. So... You know, 2006. Yeah. Mako has passed away. They're looking for someone that can approximate his voice. And I had been doing an impression for 30 years, basically, by singing along wow. on the album. So I, I love, and I always, I, I, I think it's, it's a benefit of being 60, I think. Yeah. Because you look back on your life and I can see how these innocuous little things actually were monumental. Yeah. Like, what if they hadn't given me that album on my 17th birthday? What, what if I had never, you know, if I had just now discovered it? What yeah. if I had to see Scrooge at night, you know? I, I, just... I love seeing how these little, these little strings, and on this side of life, you can look at the strings and you can connect them a little bit. Yeah. You can see how, wow, and if only this one little string had been pulled, we wouldn't be talking right now. My mind is blown right now. This is that's one of the biggest benefits I get from just getting to talk to heroes of mine like yourself is I get to look back at your life and be like, remember this cool thing you did? And then I get to enjoy these stories and share that human connection. But stuff like that. Once you start thinking about us, oh, my God, if only this tiny little thing. Yeah, that ended up being honestly the most momentous gift I ever received. Like 30 Uh, year, like 30 year difference of just like a, a gift. Uh, and because I was like, wow, this guy that's playing the reciter, man, his voice is awesome. Yeah. And shortly after that, I think because he was nominated for a Tony, he appeared, he was in uh, Conan. So he started getting a lot more publicity. And I started really following Mako's career and films that he had done in the past. And it's like, I, it's, it's remarkable. It's just absolutely. Yeah. And uh, that's incredible. It's like, it's like you were destined, you know? I, I don't know. You know? <laughs> you know? Destiny is a funny thing. There it is. There it is. I, uh, oh, and you don't. Oh. You never know how things are going to work out. You just got to keep going. And then, that's something else I always say. I saw, you know, voice acting. Aside from having a good friend who's a showrunner, the next thing I say is perseverance. 
Yeah. If you really, really, really want to do something, and I believe this with all my heart, don't ever let anybody tell you you can't do it. Mm -hmm. Just keep plugging away at it. I was 46 years old when I got the call. That really? I was, that I was going to be Uncle Iroh on Avatar. Wow. I'd admire little parts, you know, like on Shaolin Showdown. I did some video games, but, you know, I might work twice in a year if it was a good year. Right. Uh, and I, you know, just, just keep plugging away at it. That's, I was almost 50, wow. which also, as my wife points out, is probably good because if I had had any sort of success, when I, was, <laughs> I would have been the biggest asshole you ever would have right. <laughs> Well, probably it's probably better that I had a little bit of, you know, sure. life <laughs> it with at that point. Sure. Uh, I, I, I feel like, I feel like we're kindred spirits in that. We have a similar look on life as well. I, I've always thought that like, no, you never know what the future holds, right? The only way to guarantee you won't succeed is by quitting. By because quitting. There's, there's always a chance, even if it's so tiny. No, there's there's still a, a and you never know. It could be something. As, and you know what? And what's weird is the day, it wasn't the day I got the part, mm -hmm. but it was the day that I got the call that Nickelodeon wanted to see me and that I was their top pick for the role. Yeah. It was the same day that Disney had laid me off from my screen credits job. What? What is, what so, is this? What's going know, on? The universe is weird. <laughs> the universe works in really odd ways, you know? He, that's incredible. Wow. So what was that audition like? Because, I mean, those are massive shoes to fill, as you know. In, initially, I, you know, like most auditions, I just got an email from my agent, mm -hmm. you know, with the sides. And they're saying, you know, we're looking to cast this voice. And I, I knew the character. I, I'd watched Avatar the last day. Been oh, my, perfect. I knew this character. And I, and I certainly knew Mako. And I thought, well, that's weird. Well, I wonder why they're looking to uh, uh, cover some lines for Mako. Mm -hmm. and as often as the case, sometimes, you know, an actor just isn't available. I thought, well, maybe he's out of the country. Maybe they're doing some pickups on the show and they just need somebody to sound. It, it happens. Sure. You need voice match. I hear you. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And I figured, OK, that's probably what it is. And uh, so I just recorded in my office at Disney, my soon to be vacant office at Disney. Yeah. On a cheap little computer microphone from Radio Shack. You know, <laughs> Perfect. You know, long ago it was. Uh, <laughs> and just, you know, sent it in. And I remember I used to go to Comic-Con with my son in San Diego back before it got too claustrophobic. Yeah. You know, we would just, we had gone, it was something we did together. And I was down there at Comic-Con when we got the news that Mako was dead. And it's then, oh, now I understand. Sure. What's going on here? Even more pressure. And then, <laughs> well, I, I had already, fortunately, I'd already seen in the audition, which is sure. great. <laughs> they're literally auditioning for Uncle Iroh. I might have freaked out. Sure. So I thought they were looking for a voice match. And I thought, well, I do a pretty decent mock. Oh, yeah, I think I can do this. Sure. And then uh, I got the call the day I was laid off. They said, uh, you know, they want to see you. I think it was three auditions. The first one I went in, and I think it was for uh, Andrea was there. And I think the creators, oh. I think Brian were there. And I Legend. think that might have been about it. And then the third audition added to Mike and Brian and Andrea were all the Nickelodeon suits. Of course. A, a room full, you know, and I'll never forget it. I, I did, you know, I did the, 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 the scene. Mm -hmm. Andrea says, okay, we're going to turn off the sound out here. We're going to all be sitting out here talking about you. So hope you don't mind. <laughs> <laughs> and I remember looking out, and indeed I could see them all talking quite animatedly. And I thought, wow, man, this is, I feel like kind of like under some pressure here. <laughs> yeah, that's when it hits. <laughs> <laughs> oh my God. Wow. And then uh, probably it was another three weeks after that before I got the call that said, you know, you are, you, you, you know, you, you're Iroh. Man. What and a... the next day we went to Disneyland. That's exactly yeah. what we <laughs> There you go. <laughs> the whole family we took the kids out of school and we're going to disneyland there you go we gotta we gotta get rid of some of these nerves that's a lot <laughs> that's so crazy because yeah i know you worked on um uh the you did an episode of spongebob which is also pretty cool yeah yeah you know? i like i always like if i'm at a con or something and people are just you know you always say oh well what do you do so i'm a voice actor and then the next question is always well what are you on yeah and usually yep. i'll lead with well have you ever watched avatar the last airbender no, yeah. no. <laughs> have you ever heard of samurai jack oh i don't know that one okay if i'm down to that point i say well have you ever heard of spongebob there you go yeah, yeah, spongebob <laughs> is always the one like, oh yeah okay. 
okay, yeah. Although more, more, honestly, I think the Avatar fandom is it's the it's the greatest rival of the Star Wars fandom. Yeah, you know? I I I uh, I always tell people I'm like Avatar: Last Airbender is the greatest animated show of all time. It just it's next level. And you know it's crazy. My wife grew up on it, but I did not. So she introduced me to it like maybe eight years, well, probably like 10 years ago now. And so she's like, you haven't seen Avatar? I was like, no, I, I haven't. I mean, I've heard it's good. So we bought the DVD set and then just binged it. And it was like, oh, right. I'm a different person now. <laughs> I think I realized the power of the show. I mean, I, I love my little brother, but my little brother growing up, we went to college, is also an actor. So we've always had cool. a little, sort of a, you know, like little rivalry. And when he called me up and he had binged it one weekend. Yeah, yeah, yeah. God, dude, that's wonderful work. What a great show. I'm so proud that you're my brother and you're in that. And it's like, okay, this show must we be did it. Really, really <laughs> awesome. You know, yeah. my little brother's calling me up, but you know, it, it must really be that's thing. when you know. I, I have a little brother as well. It's the same thing. It's like if you ever get credit for anything, you did something really good. <laughs> and then I mean, I always thought, wow, this is a beautifully written character. This is a beautiful show, possibly the best finale of any show television show live oh, yeah. animated absolutely ever. because absolutely. it just tied up everything in such a beautiful bow and it was just it was it was perfect and yeah. i always knew that it, that it was that but it wasn't until i started going to comic cons that oh, i yeah i wrote was even more than that oh yeah oh yeah because i literally i literally have done the voice and I, it's it sounds like a cliche but it's true i have seen grown men cry when they yeah. hear the voice yeah i and, yeah i'm there i'm one of those grown men <laughs> I, it's, it's something it's 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 the weirdest thing and i i'm honored and, and humbled that i get to be st the steward of this in a way yeah uh, it, it, it's absolutely remarkable uh, and I say, I, in fact, I just, I have to remember sometimes because I think I'm just a fat old guy that's on Twitter. <laughs> you know, that's what I think of myself. And then, and then I wake up Monday morning and, oh my God, Melissa, Entertainment Weekly has written an article about something I tweeted. And my wife is like, all right, Greg, what did you do? <laughs> and I'm going, oh, you know, I peer out right. and go through and clean up my more, you know, <laughs> I forget uh, people are watching. <laughs> yeah, I forget. And it's like, no, 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 it's good. It's good. And it was because, and it was a year with the pandemic had happened. And I was watching the Tom Hanks movie about Mr. Rogers. Yeah. Beautiful. And that's when I made the connection. It's like, I think this is why this character means so much to people. He's a father figure. He's yeah. Mr. Rogers. He's a teacher. He's an educator. He's someone that everyone mm -hmm. is immediately comfortable with. And oh, yeah. Trusts. Oh yeah, and I, I I truly believe again. I I think as a result of my suggestion, as my wife said, one of three things will happen. I'll get a call and say, "On Nickelodeon, I would like to talk to you about your uh, about your idea." You know, our Nickelodeon I'll, number two, Nickelodeon won't even call at all. Mm -hmm. Number three, a lawyer from Nickelodeon will call. <laughs> yes, <to order. laughs> So it'll there's, be. It'll, there's still time. Yeah, one of those. <laughs> Of those three you know possibilities i no, dude it is true and it's a testament to you as a performer that you're able to carry that weight and give that nuance but that character i will say i'm one of those people i i don't know how to enjoy things moderately i don't know i'm just not wired that way i'm a very all or nothing kind of person if i like something i like it a lot and iroh i will say uh qui-gon jinn from episode one i was like eight years old that's like my guy like i i'm i am who i am as a man because of that fictional character i'm like what would he do i'm gonna that. do that dude it, i like the prequels i, I, I love the, dude the i i'm literally surrounded by qui-gon stuff all the time i'm like that's who i want to be but iroh is the other side of that coin iroh like he iroh is one of those characters that he teaches in a way that like you can you know what my favorite thing about iroh is i'll tell you so because <laughs> you ask uh <laughs> he is a perfect example of not allowing your pain to determine whether you're going to put it onto other people. Absolutely. Like I, I, I don't know if you can see it. Let me move stuff around. So. Oh, I'm, I'm admiring. I'm admiring your collection. Thank you. Thank you. So that right there is a painting of Iroh and his son, and then there's leaves from the vine written. Oh, out. it's yeah, Lutan. I've seen it. Yeah. So 
that I think about all the time because I'm like, you know, I, I've, I've suffered a lot of loss in my life, but Iroh has as well. And I remember the first time I saw that episode, uh, you know, when he, the one that's dedicated to Mako and Iroh is like teaching this guy how to mug people and like, <laughs> you know, like a kid's crying and he plays this song to make this kid happy, but he plays the same song at the end. And I remember when that episode was done, I, I this has only happened to me like twice in my life where I started crying and then I couldn't stop, but I couldn't like figure out why. And then after thinking about it, I'm like, think about how tough it was for him to play that song for someone else for someone to make else. it feel better. It meant so much to him. Yeah. So like that's something Iroh does, I think, very well. Is like shows what it, it's something to aspire to be. You know, it's like he's in the most pain possible. He lost his kid, but he's using that to make another kid happy. It's like goals, goals. And, I want to be that guy. And, you know? and I, I think, though, I think the world needs that right now. I couldn't agree more i mean again i was i was i was i I think on saturday because i was i was had tweeted this was thinking about it and it was fred rogers birthday yeah and i didn't watch the tom hanks movie i watched the documentary they had made about him oh that's another one before big time and oh (laughs) yeah i'm over over. (laughs) yep couldn't stop i I was thinking i was they were talking about how his very first week uh, uh rfk was assassinated and he was talking to children about assassinations. Yeah. Like, oh my God. If Iroh had been able to talk to children about during this last year about staying home and, you know, mm-hmm. it's important to do this and everybody still loves you when you're still going to be safe, but you have to be home now and you can be separate, but together at the same time. And it's like, I, I think, I don't know. I really want it. The problem is I put it out of the universe. And now I really want it. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> It's important. It's important to have characters like that. That's why art's so important. That's why I think uh, it's really important to have like a character like Iroh, where you're like, you have a, like a compass point, you know, where you're like, this is, I can see it. So I want to be it. And you have a reference, you know? And he talks to me. Uh, Honestly, I, 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 uh, I've said, sometimes I'll be tweeting and literally I'll have Iroh on one shoulder. Yeah. But Aku is on the other. Of course. Sometimes I heed Aku's advice. Of course. You're human. You know. I tweet this. Oh, tweet it, Baldwin. Tweet it. (laughs) Maybe you should not tweet that. No, do not listen to that fool. Yeah. (laughs) He doesn't know what he's talking about. (laughs) You is actually so how long after you got Iroh did they approach you with Aku? Because that was also Mako. That was in 2000 and let's see, it was, I think it was 2000 and when was Trump elected? Was that 2016? Yeah, unfortunately, yeah. (laughs) I think it was, I think it was the the horrible year of 2016. Yeah, that's the one. Yeah, yeah, you know, it was because again, it's one of those weird things that sometimes, sometimes, I, in my life, I found that really good things happen on the same day, but sometimes really bad things have happened at the same time as well. Sure, I've had sure. Days where were, oh, I can't believe this horrible thing. Both of these horrible things has happened today. Yeah, yeah. This particular day, the day that I found out that uh, I was Aku, mm-hmm. it was the very same day uh, I did a film. I've done very little uh, on-camera work. But I was lucky enough to be in Hail Caesar. Yep, Coen Brothers movie with George Clooney. George Clooney. Yeah, and it was, uh, it was the, the film had premiered that week, and it had just opened at the AMC in Burbank. And we had put out a Facebook invitation to all our friends, to say, you know what, I'm going to be at this eight o'clock screening. If you want to come and watch it with me, come and come. And I had like 150, 200 friends show up at this AMC. Dude. So, and so the same day, and I'm going, and they don't even know that. I'm going, oh, guys, oh, by the way, I just found out I'm Aku. Thank you guys for all cheering when I walked <laughs> to the AMC theater. Right. So it, was a, it was a good day. It was a very good day. That's awesome. <laughs> is, is Aku hard on your voice? Because it's intense. It's more intense. But honestly, I could do my, I, I'm as comfortable with Mako's voice or my yeah. approximation of it as my own pretty much. Sure. Okay. The only thing I've ever had a trouble had trouble with voice acting was the video games. Oh, really? Is really it different? Hard. Well, video games, like they might have you, you know, you all right, 
this time you're being hit, but lightly. Okay. The oh, next it's all efforts. Hard. I want three of those now. Okay. Now you're in excruciating pain. Give me three of those. Okay. Now you're being burned alive. Can all I right. have three, <laughs> can I have three of those takes? So, you know, if you do three burned alive takes in a row, that can yeah. be get a little sore. That's, <laughs> that's another thing they don't tell you about like, Oh, you want to be a voice actor in video games. Let me introduce you to efforts. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> You know, it's interesting. I've always loved doing the video games and then playing the video games. Yeah. I was really uh, proud of uh, to be involved with Ghost of Tsushima. I, I yeah. Really oh, my God. It's so good. It's a beautiful game. And your voice, I recognized right away when I walked I was, by the guy. I was, like, I, I was like under, you know, threat of, you know, threat of extreme loss, not to mention, because it was in an expansion that my yeah. voice was. And mm -hmm. you are not to mention or say anything about it. You're just additional voices. Do not mention that you're Gyozen. And that morning, I knew, okay, the game is released now. And I was online finding out how quickly someone was playing the game and saying, hey, I think that's, that's. <laughs> and literally, it was within probably five minutes. <laughs> and at that point, I noticed that the ghost of Tsushima social media had liked this comment. Uh, of this person oh they're looking they're watching too and at that point i said okay i think it's probably okay for me to come out and say yeah yeah it's me you know that's uh, so cool it's so, you've been a part of some of the coolest stuff yeah i know you're uh um uh, frank fontaine in bioshock another great role a great game you know uh i will i originally read atlas i always it's an interesting story because you know fontaine is also atlas right and when i did the role I guess the original, it was Woody Kindly. He was a Southern, he was a Southern type. Yeah. Well, would you kindly, would you kindly? Huh. And so, uh, for, so for some reason, you know, I, they replaced it with the, uh, with the Irish. I think he was, I think mm -hmm. his name was, is Kurt Hanover. I think that's his name. Mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. did wonderful work. Uh, and so I'm just fine. Originally I was Atlas and Fontaine. He's Atlas. And I'm sort of Fontaine. I think it might be some of him too. And also sometimes they've altered the voice electronically, Fontaine, a little bit. So sometimes it's hard for me to even hear myself in it. Oh, cool. But I mean, it, it credits me. So, so I guess I did. <laughs> <laughs> That's true. Well, speaking of other credits, so we have another connection as well. Uh, Randall Duke Kim is a buddy of mine. And he uh, was Uguay in Kung Fu Panda. Uguay, Uguay, yeah, yeah, I did it in Uguay. And that was probably one of those situations where he just didn't have time to do the video game or whatever, you know. Right. But so cool. It's, cool. it's it is, all, the Venn diagram is closing. <laughs> I, I am, sometimes when I'm at a con, you know, and I'm surrounded with the pictures of my characters, I'm going, whoa, man, I have done some cool stuff. You have, <laughs> you wow. have been involved of the, the star wars franchise i'm yep. involved you know, you're I've master been... sanube i'm aware of your work greg <laughs> i have a theory about sanube oh yeah talk to me what do you got i have a theory i I'm think sanube who worked at the jedi temple he worked with the younglings we've seen it uh-huh uh-huh sanube saved grogu oh. that is my theory i'm in i'm we in don't, I mean, and we don't know to this day. I look to this day. We don't know. Sunube nope. end is unknown. That's true. And probably assume that he died in the Jedi Temple after Order sixty six. Yeah, but we don't know. But we he, don't know. And, and he, my favorite line that he says is, "The value of moving slowly is one can clearly see the path ahead." That's right. All the path ahead, and said, "Okay, I need to get off planet." now take this grogu kid and, and get yeah. that uh i'm in i fully I, subscribed I would, to I this now <laughs> that character uh he's so fun Star Wars things he was my favorite one because also he was a jedi master and his yeah. lightsaber was it was a king <laughs> yeah. yeah yeah that's one of that was one of my first favorite episodes because the whole like just be patient and he's like riding his little bike, like really he's below the speed limit. Guy, you know? <laughs> <laughs> what was it? Dave Filoni said to me, and I loved working. He would he would sit there. I mean, usually it only takes about half an hour, an hour to do a twenty-two minute episode. Oh, cool. But but for a Clone Wars, you know, and Dave Filoni, he would take generally the full three hours because he would have he would know everything there was to know about your character. Yeah. Yeah would tell you everything you needed to know and he said and i thought this was great he said he said you know sunube is not 
as old as Yoda. Let me put it this way. Sanube was a freshman and Yoda was a senior. They're very, very very (laughs) close in age, you know. Right. That's Uh, funny. (laughs) I'd love love to revisit that character. And, you know, the... uh, and this is also a little, a little tool, a secret of the trade. Yeah, yeah. And it's also, it's how I work. I find sometimes it's easier to character to latch on to an existing impression. Yeah, yeah. And you can build off that. You start with something and you can build that and make your own. So if you listen to Terrace Sanube and then go back and watch Richard Harris as Dumbledore in the yeah. first part of the films, You'll know exactly where I got that voice. <laughs> so good. I love it. Little hints of David Attenborough as well. I love yes, it. Yes, absolutely. I love it. That's awesome. I've heard that before. And it's like, I've also heard that like a bad impression is a good character. Absolutely. You know, yeah. absolutely. You know, the, the master of it. I, to, to go back, circle back to Jeff Bennett. Jeff Bennett was the master of it. Yeah. Movie. Yeah. You know, he took a character like Johnny Bravo, which is essentially an impression of Elvis Presley. Yep. But he made it Johnny Bravo. You know, yeah. you didn't think when you were watching it, oh, that's Jeff doing an impression of Elvis Presley. Right. Johnny Bravo, man. It's so cool. I, you, you've done some you've done some cool things, Greg. You've done some cool things. What so that what was it like then? Because you're bouncing around and you've done all these things in a relatively short amount of time. What was it like getting the call for Legend of Korra to be like, all oh, right. Oh, I was great. Back. It was great. Because yeah. I, I was going, you know, I was going, you know, oh, it's so great to be Ira. Oh, this is great. What? They're only doing one more season. Ah, yeah. <laughs> so ah. close. <laughs> so, yeah, so close. And it's like, no, I was very happy. I was very happy. And indeed, my work as Iro, I think some of the things that I, I, some of my favorite lines that I delivered uh, mm-hmm. were from Legend of Korra. Yeah. Oh, yeah. He has some some wonderful. I, I honestly think that my favorite Iro line, my own lifeline, as a word, when I'm feeling bad, and it, it's it's you know, if you look for the light, you can often find it. If you look for the dark, that is all you will ever see. <sighs> that is, especially in the year that we've been through, it's been a real touchstone, you know, for me. And I yeah, I I, I included in my cameos lots of times because it, it really is. I was out walking. Uh, it was probably a, about a year ago, nine months ago, and it was the height of the pandemic. And I remember just that walk with my wife. It was a beautiful day. The birds were singing and the sun was shining. And it's like, you know, yeah, this bad stuff is happening, but also look at all this good stuff mm-hmm. that I've never even noticed, you know, that most of the time I don't even notice. And now yeah. I am noticing it because if you look for the light, you can often find it. I, yeah. I it, it's back to your point that he's like Mr. Rogers. Look for the helpers. Yes. Look for the helpers. It's exactly the same thing. Yeah. And I think I think it probably does help with my approach to Iroh as I've started to realize he's almost more than an animated character. He's something bigger than that. Absolutely. Than you know, uh, and I've always been very, very interested in spirituality. Yeah, same. And I always and I always say, you know, I, I am not understand. Do not one moment say that I'm saying that Greg Baldwin is the equivalent of Fred Rogers. Absolutely. <laughs> that man, saint. The character of Mr. Rogers was Fred Rogers. Right. He would pray every night, like my name for you. Know, he would do that. Yeah. My, he was a, a wonderful. Uh, and he was an ordained Presbyterian minister. Now, mm-hmm. I am not an ordained Presbyterian minister, but I am an ordained Presbyterian deacon. I... And I've always been very interested, especially in, in Christianity and what it, what it should be. As sure. Opposed to what it has been. I'm with you. That's I'm another. You. That's another. You know. That's another podcast. I'm with you. Uh, <laughs> I've always. I've always been very interested, in it, and I think sometimes that serves me well. Just my my interest in spiritual matters. Yeah. You know, and I, I think I think it is very helpful. But no, I'm not. I'm not Fred Rogers. You know, maybe sort of, kind of. Fred Rogers uh, yeah. dropped an occasional f bomb and smoked weed. Of course. <laughs> Listen, you're the Fred Rogers of the time. <laughs> 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 but you know the the point is and i i one thing i am good good at if i can say one of my strong i'm self-aware yeah that's important self-aware is very important to know when you're being an asshole to know who you are and what your place is and to know when you're when you're wrong sure Sure. To know when, oh, I just made a conscious effort not to be kind. I made a conscious effort to hit send on that tweet. 
right when maybe i shouldn't have you know sure and i think that's a very very important uh aspect of all humans and it's served, so. it served me well i'm so i i get i'm self-aware enough to know that under no circumstances am i fred rogers yeah <laughs> really there was only one of those to my knowledge yeah they're really <laughs> But I think we, I think, you know, we could take the lessons that he taught thinking could be adapted. And I think that, that Iroh was the perfect conduit for that. Uh, nothing will probably ever come of it because that's just the way these things are. There are yeah. <laughs> other people in the are smarter, with, smarter than me with the degrees and they understand these things. And uh, I think it's always funny because people think that actors, I could call up Gendy Tartakovsky right now and say, hey, Gendy, I got this great idea for a show, you know. No, no, it doesn't work that way. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Mike, right. So what do you think, man? Uh, what do you think? Can we green light this? No, it doesn't work that way. Right. I, I'm, I'm work for hire. Right. Yep. It, it, I'm glad I put it out there. And I'm especially glad that it seemed like there was some interest in it. Yeah. You know? Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. And I, you know, it's just, I think wisdom transcends the art. You know, I think it's all, it's all relative. And I think it, it's evergreen. There are things that Iroh have done and even like being self-aware, you know, acknowledging and looking at these things is great advice just for life to be like, all right, this is all choices. Yeah. Just absolutely. so we understand that <laughs> you can be better. Needs it. And you can, you can choose to be kind. It's a conscious choice. Always. It literally is. It's a conscious choice going back to Twitter to send, hit send or don't send. Yep. And we all have, and oh my God, social media is the miracle. Yeah, the technology, the miracle <laughs> with which I can I can talk to people on the other side of the world. I am I feel like I am friends with people on Twitter that I would never have met in real life. Same, you know? same, and it's it's remarkable. But also, social media is going to kill us all. Of course, so it's, the, no <laughs> <laughs> it's the law of equivalent exchange. You know, <laughs> yeah. for every action, there is an equal and opposite. Yeah. <laughs> that's just how that's how it works. We got the internet and discovered fire. But also our <laughs> houses are made of straw. So. Exactly. So, you know, maybe. And wisdom comes with that. The problem is we have all this cool stuff and we're very intelligent, but we lack wisdom. Exactly. Exactly. But wisdom comes from experience. It's those so, whole things like it's tough being a person. That's what I find. Yes, it is. <laughs> it is. But it's also endlessly fascinating. I agree. You know, I, agree. I, I must say in all my life thus far, I have not been bored yet. Yeah. Yeah. That's the goal, really. You know? there's, there's always something interesting every new day is interesting even this this groundhog day like year that we've all yeah <laughs> also there's all you know i haven't really gotten bored I, i've never been in a global pandemic before it's a first for me <laughs> true know? true oh i'll do so many things just to talk about it later on like this is a bad idea but if i survive yeah. it'll be a great story <laughs> i never it never occurred to me to just go to the grocery store and put my life in jeopardy you know yeah no. <laughs> How much do Oreos really mean to us, Greg? How much do they really mean to us? <laughs> well, let's just Instacart that bad boy. Well, that'll work. You know? There you go. Technology, once again. <laughs> this is how this works. And, you know, technology. And who knows how many, who knows how many lives Instacart saved? You're right. You're well, right. Who would have thought? Who knows how many lives Instacart saved? Because people didn't have to go to the grocery store and be vulnerable mm -hmm. to this virus. Mm -hmm. Mm hmm. Oh, what a year! What a year it's been. It's wild. That's all great life advice, though. So then I'm wondering, do you do you have advice then for like, you know, you said a lot of people talk about they want to get into acting and stuff like that. So as a great performer, I'll give you the title uh, that you've more than earned. Do you have advice for any actors coming up? I think the the first thing is persevere. Yeah. Do not, do not be dissuaded from it. If you can do something else and be happy, do that. Yeah, fair. Because fair. it is not an easy gig. You know, I mean, there are some parts of it that are great, but, you know, you, you really have to have a tough skin because the rejection, even now, every now and then there'll be a part I'm like, oh, man, I really want that. And of course, they never call. Of course. Oh, so you, you, ha you have to understand that that is part and parcel and you have to just let it roll off your back. Mm -hmm. uh others you know people say i want to be a voice actor well the first thing you need to do is be an actor yeah absolutely it is it is acting and i say you know take classes for me theater is my first love uh i've come to albuquerque thinking oh i'm gonna get to do some community theater again it's been years <laughs> oh, well, 
not yet. Uh uh uh. Act every chance you have, and then and then from a purely you know uh, nitpicky perspective, I think it's very helpful to learn to do, especially with voice acting, as many dialects well. Oh. You. And I also think it's a good idea to do as many impressions well as you can because mm -hmm. they can all be adapted. Sure. Humphrey Bogart, but I want to do a Humphrey Bogart with a with a Cockney accent, and suddenly it becomes like this, and suddenly it's an altogether different character. Sure, you know, that. So I I think if you can learn to do that, it helps you in the approach to the characters, and all and, and also you know uh, learn to cold read. Cold reading is you know. Oh yeah. Cold reading is is, is a really good job skill to have, and learn to and this just comes from acting and working with directors learn to make the adjustments right be directable yeah mm -hmm. if you're if you're in a recording booth you really don't want to go over three takes for something yeah <laughs> you know, you <laughs> that's really, great advice ideally you want to nail it on the first take and they'll get a second one for safety mm -hmm. you really don't want to if you're gonna if you're going into five takes then you're costing them money oh right because it's time because uh, it's time so you really, you really want to be able to be a, a good cold reader because, I mean, obviously you practice the lines before you've gone in, but you know, you are reading the lines. You don't have to memorize them. So right. learn how to make the adjustments, you know, and sometimes the adjustments are weird. I had a, uh, back in college, it wasn't a direction given to me, thank God, but I remember thinking this is, this is really, uh, this is going to be difficult to play. It was uh, Shakespeare's King Lear and the oh, director perfect. told someone one of the earls i think it was gloucester someone said okay what i want you to play in the scene is the fragmentation of mankind oh okay okay uh, could you give me maybe something a little more specific but be nice. yeah. you know i'll try but i <laughs> say this was a really good actor and damn if he didn't pull it off <laughs> <laughs> like, wow that guy's awesome man i want to be him when i grow up yeah Man, I, I love that. I think that's great, solid advice that's also practical. So well done. Well done, Greg. Well, thank you. And, 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 and the showrunner thing. I cannot stress yeah. this <laughs> enough. Make friends with a showrunner. Make friends with an animation, a showrunner, and you will be. Right. <laughs> Make sure you vacation together. Your family's vacation together. That's a good one, too. That's it. Okay, hold on. Let me write that down. All right. Vacation we went to Disney World together. So yeah. Nice. Yeah. <laughs> family and my family went back in 2003 yes yeah, so perfect perfect oh that's i mean you know what that's the best advice i've ever heard that sounds foolproof <laughs> it is fool it's a foolproof you know it is foolproof plan you cannot, oh, you cannot, cannot go wrong fantastic tried and true it's math checks out <laughs> <laughs> well dude just like that we've been talking for over and we did it oh good heavens we did it greg well, but you know what? I am sorry that it took me so long. I am terrible at procrastinating. No, this was uh, more than worth the wait. This was incredible. I had a great time. Good, I did too. Good. And, you know, again, again, not Mister Rogers. As right. I said, yeah. <laughs> narcissistic <laughs> asshole. Actors are narcissistic, and I am. Right. And I, <laughs> so I love talking about myself. Right. You know? <laughs> I we'll can get... talk about wisdom and tea as well, but you know, I also like talking about Greg Baldwin. So you know, that's what I'm here for. Greg Baldwin. Listen, we'll get we'll be, we'll get bumper stickers made that just say "Not Fred Rogers." <laughs> not Fred Rogers. Not Mr. Rogers. I love it. Oh man! So before I let you go, though, I got to ask: Where can people find you online? I know you're killing it with cameo. Talk to me. Uh, uh, just you know, at Greg Baldwin, I wrote for Twitter. Uh, uh, my mm -hmm. my tweets have become a lot more sedate of late, as the world has become a bit more sedate. Sure, lately. sure. A little uh, more Iro. Greg Baldwin Iro on Instagram. Mm -hmm. uh, I think it's just Greg Baldwin on Facebook. I I, I did it. My kids are still explaining TikTok to me. I'm old. Yeah, I, I'm, I've I'm got an account there. I've I've posted a couple of things, but I don't quite get it. I'm it takes, still trying to get forever. Instagram. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Twitter, I understood. Twitter, I took to and understood. Sure, of course, sure. That was, that's interesting. Uh, I, I had been on Twitter for years. Mm -hmm. And it was about the time of Samurai Jack. And it suddenly occurred to me, you know, Greg, maybe you could use Twitter as a tool instead of just for insulting Donald Trump every time. <laughs> wait, I you can do that, other things? Maybe Why? That work. And then I said, wait a minute. Twitter made Donald Trump what he is. 
That's Maybe, true. Greg, you should go with this. Maybe <laughs> you could be president. <laughs> I'm not discounting it. <laughs> listen, listen, you got my vote. <laughs> and your campaign might, slogan will be not Mr. Rogers. <laughs> I, might, I might very well. Uh, I get it. It occurs to me if Trump could be president, I could certainly be a city councilman in Albuquerque. Absolutely. So, Who know, wouldn't who vote knows? for Iroh? Listen, <laughs> I'm in. It sounds like too much work. We'll figure it out. We'll figure it out. <laughs> Again, if I learned nothing in life, never discount anything. That's right. Hey, we never know. <laughs> 10 years from now, we'll do this again in the Oval Office. Ex- I'm in. <laughs> I'm in. <laughs> and... My Hello, friends. Thank you so much for listening to this episode of The Interesting Podcast. If you'd like to follow the show, it's at Pod of Interest on Twitter. If you'd like to follow me, I'm at Jedi Brian on all social media sites. You can also find me at BrianBalance.com. There you'll find all my demos and a bunch of other fun stuff. If you enjoyed this episode, please share it and tell your friends. A good rating or review always helps and is greatly appreciated. Let the people know we've got some cool stuff going on over here. Speaking of cool stuff, we now have merch. Just search The Interesting Podcast on tpublic.com to get you some sweet gear. I've also got a Patreon, so if you'd like to support the show more directly, you now have that option over at patreon.com slash jedibrian. On that note, special thanks to Bernice, Chris, Ben, Jim, Daz, Kelly, Daryl, and Victor. Your support means so, so much, and I cannot tell you how much I appreciate it. So until next time, be well.